Disney is the center, though. Disney is the thing that has attracted so much attention. These other things are being developed. It's a great story. So you come in there, and it looks <laughs> like it's not going to be built. Uh, they had, had, there was tough economic times, as I remember. Uh, they, Frank Gehry was to be the architect. And this comes to being the unreasonable man in part. He, he was the architect. He was the architect. And is the architect. And you had had, and he is, and you had had a relationship with him having to do with building a house for you. That's correct. Tell me the story. Every single chapter. Oh, oh boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> no, I've known, I've known and respected Frank Gehry uh, from the day we got to Los Angeles and probably before that. Yeah. Uh, Frank really didn't want to do houses. But I, I'm, I'm persuasive. But an unreasonable man would insist that he yeah, do a house. Exactly. And Edie said, what are you doing that for? <laughs> so he, he went ahead, and he was doing a lot of public buildings. And uh, yeah. he said, I'll design your house. And he was not doing construction documents at the yeah. time. So for two years, he, he, he would present things. You mean like certificate of, I mean, uh, just construction documents, going to the city hall and getting yeah, all yeah, the documents yeah, you yeah. need to build He would out. just be the design architect. So. He presented seven different schemes. We approved every one. I thought they were all wonderful. And what he'd say is, uh, let me refine it. And what I learned that meant, he starts over. And I got, <laughs> and, I, and after two and a half years of this, I got a little impatient and finally pushed him to, to, to finish uh, the design, which we love. He was not too happy with my well, being but he, impatient. Okay, here's what I know. Um, <laughs> but it, but it, didn't it get to the point where, uh, you said, I'm going to go ahead and build the building. I'm going to build my house, and I'm going to oversee the construction because I'm not waiting any longer. <laughs> Is that a fair appraisal? Yeah, and, he, and Frank chose someone to do the construction documents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We love the house. But, but did Frank insist that it did not be called a Gary building because there had been some tension there? Oh, he's talked about it, but... Uh, we're good friends. We, okay, have, dinner, so, we so have dinner we, once a month uh, now well, or so. Oh, see, this is a story. Now, this is what un, you chose the title, <laughs> The Art of the Unreasonable. Uh, so, so then you go to Disney, and guess who the architect is? They need you to raise the money <laughs> okay. to do Disney. Here's a story. Lillian Disney, Walt's whiz, right. widow, gave $50 million. No, was she, was she, was she, okay, well, was, it, was it Roy's widow? or uh, No, Walt's widow. It was Walt's widow, okay. Uh, in seven years came and went, and... Uh, uh, the county of Los Angeles built a parking garage below it right. and, and a deck for the building. And, and they didn't, no one was raising any money. They'd spent a lot of money on all sorts of things. And, and I was staring at it, and uh, Dick Reardon, the mayor, was staring at it. I said, We can't let this happen. Right. So we went ahead and uh, raised $200 million to make it happen. A significant portion of it was yours or not? Pardon? A part of it was yours. Part of it, yes, yes. Yeah. Dick, I even got Dick Reardon, to get, our yeah. mayor, to give five million. Now, was there was, was there a part of it that that you that you were going to have final approval of the? No. What happened is this contract was for design only, and he had another architect doing construction documents, the plans. And they spent a lot of money, and Frank decided uh, the plans were no good. Uh, so I got involved, looked at all of this, and said, "How do we get it built now?" Uh, one of the ideas I had, which Frank did not like, was getting a major general contractor uh, to do the plans, giving him total design control. Right. He didn't like that. So we ended up uh, yielding to what he wanted to do, and he started, did the construction documents. Took a little longer, cost a little more money, but uh, great building. He's happy. Well, but so th what, then there was a, you, the building opening was, in fact, viewed as Herbert Mouchon and others said, this is a great building, a, a remarkable, and they, they continue to say that about it. It is a great building. Because it actually was designed before the Guggenheim at Bilbao was designed. Exactly. And so all of a sudden it wasn't getting built though, and then, <laughs> so you got called the savior, Frank's building was built. You know, and then they have, uh, th then they, they had the following thing, I think this took place, I may have forgotten some of the facts, but here it is, because it's a great story. And we don't want to let fact get in the brain with a good story, do we? <laughs> <laughs> so, so therefore, th there was a big party, and then, and and basically, uh, Frank basically paid tribute to you as a savior, and then you were asked to speak, and you got up, and your toast simply said, "Frank won." Frank won, and Frank was right. P 
people ask what oh, did it oh, Frank was right. That's what you said. Frank was right. And, 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 and people ask, what did it cost? I said, it's priceless. Priceless. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about, I mentioned the rabbit, about Jeff Koons and how your relationship with him, who you played a significant role. I assume all this is going to be, you're writing your biography, you're writing it with the same author, correct? Yes, yes. So that'll be coming out later. Why did you go ahead with this when you're writing your biography? You could have included some of that material in your biography. Well, I start, we, we start a biography. That may go on for a long time. But, you know, over the years, people ask me, how did you do this? Right. How did you do that? How did you start two Fortune 500 companies? Right. And more recently, philanthropy, how do you at age 78 get involved in education reform, scientific and medical right. research, the arts, and so on? So I thought about it and said, well, Maybe you ought to write a book so people can learn from what I've done yep. and also learn from all the mistakes I've made along the way. So we ended up writing this fun book, and I was fortunate to have Mike Bloomberg write the foreword and so on. And, and say what he said. Yeah. I'm just going to read I wrote this down, and so I want to see it here, and I've got to oh. find it, which is well, <laughs> it's exactly right. But anyway, here's what I want to talk about, because it is every, all of us do this in one way or the other in our lives. We're in constant negotiation about something. Uh, right? Yes. So what do you know about negotiation that would serve us, whether we are making a business deal, whether we're negotiating for a mortgage, whether <clears throat> we're trying to convince our children to do something that we think is in their best interest? What's the art of negotiation? I think the art of negotiation is to thinking about what the other party really needs or wants. And, and in some cases, uh, they may not know exactly what they want, so you, you might help them define what they want. And one of the examples was acquiring the, the collection from uh, Count Panza, right, the, right. the grade 80 works that yeah. became the foundation of uh, Museum of Contemporary Arts collection. This was an Italian count who had a remarkable collection, Rauschenberg and, and Rothko and a whole bunch of other I mean, really remarkable collection. And he did not want, because of taxes, to leave them in Italy, and he wanted to Exactly. Bring them to a museum. They were in Switzerland, and, and there was a communist government right. said, any Italians that have property outside of the country or in the country, we're going to tax. He, he couldn't pay the tax. So he went to both auction houses and got estimates and so on. But he wanted to keep the collection together, and he was on the board of the Museum of Contemporary Art. So we talked about it and talked about it, and I said, look, we don't have... 11 or 12 million dollars to pay you now. But I've got a better idea. Why don't we give you three million dollars, we'll keep the collection together. And by the way, if we gave you all the money now, you'd have to convert it to lira. Yeah. And lira was a very weak currency going down every yeah. month. So I convinced yeah. him, and he convinced himself, he was better off not getting all the money now. Yeah. Because the lira was going down, and there'd be more dollars, and you were paying him in dollars, and he could take it back to Italy. Exactly. Get a lot more lira so later. So we paid him over seven. It was seven years, but we paid him off early. And it worked out very well for him and, and Mocha. And what happened to the art? It's all there. It's Museum all part of the contemporary yeah. art. It's a, it, it established a standard of quality. Great Rothko's, as you mentioned, right. great Rauschenberg, great Kleins, right. Oldenburg, and a number of other artists. This brings me to another point about you. Uh, you have insisted, and this is the reason sometimes there are differences of opinion out in L.A. Uh, about what museums, and, and you have come to uh, very strong exchanges with people because you have a very specific idea of what a museum ought to be and ought to do. That's true. Tell me what it is. I think a museum has an obligation to educate the broadest possible public and also to advance scholarship. And a museum is not about simply curators uh, doing things that satisfy other professionals in the field or collectors like right. myself. So I'm a populist. I believe the, the production of art is an elitist activity, but I believe showing art should be a populist activity. Mm -hmm. You also believe that the permanent collection should be on exhibition a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we bought this great collection for a number of years. It wasn't being shown. It is now being shown. Yeah. And so is, it, is the broad museum, the collection, broad collection, or the broad museum that's going to be there, is that, the broad museum, I mean, is that going to be different? I mean, uh, all of the philosophy that you have brought to this, uh, 
Here's the interesting question. Where is your collection going? Okay. We started, uh, it started with a personal collection. Right. Then when our walls were filled and we had more art than we could possibly show, 27 This is years, like 2,000 pieces or something? Yeah, we're 2,000 now. So we started a foundation. And the idea of the foundation was to build a collection of contemporary art and lend it to museums, a lending right, library right, of right, art. Right. We've made over 8,000 loans to 480 institutions. We do have a place in Santa Monica. Uh, we've got storage in five facilities, and I said it is time that we find a place to build a building that will have public space, like 50,000 square feet, like, which is about uh, of gallery space, which is like one and a quarter, one and a half times the size of the Whitney, and it'll have storage facilities, and it'll have space for uh, our, our foundation. So it's under construction, it'll be open in 18 months. Uh, so the collection will be there. And we'll lend it to any museum that wants to show it on the walls. If they want to put it in their basement, our idea is send it back and we'll find another place to show it. Now can you show what's the, the part of the permanent collection at MOCA at, at your museum? No. They may lend us some things. I bet they will. But we, you know, but we, we've got some artists in great depth, so yeah. like we've got the biggest collection of Cindy Sherman right. who we met back in 1982. What did you think of the recent exhibition here? I think it's great. We lent a number of things yeah. here. We've got the biggest collection of Jeff Koons' work, who right. I also met, met back in 1982. Well, but but that, tell that story, too, because that's an interesting story because he was on hard times. He, he yes, had he some did. real economic issues, and you came in, and, and that's... I came in and was was delighted to be able to buy three major works from him well, we'll at an this. embarrassing low price compared to what it was today, yeah. what, what the work's uh, selling at today. What's, what is it about Jeff Kuhn's work that you think is, captures the imagination? I mean, the rabbit is one of them. <laughs> I think did he's you like it at first sight? I did, I did. Because I did. you thought it had I remember going to a studio, which is on, uh, which on Broadway in Houston at the time, and uh, seeing all this work, the Celebration Series, I was very impressed with it, this great balloon dog and lots of other things. Yeah. In fact, I did something that uh, uh, I, I rarely uh, uh, think ought to be done. I, I gave him and his dealers money to produce it before they even had anything to, mm. to show for it. Uh, this is a terrible question, but of all the things that you own, wh what brings you the greatest satisfaction? I mean the art. There are a lot of things to do. I love, uh, I, I, I love the, the rabbit, which we have at home now. Right. It's been on museum loan. In fact, uh, it, it's going on another loan. Jeff's having a show at, in Frankfurt and also at the Beiler in uh, Basel, Switzerland. Right. We, we, we love lending work. We want people to see the work. Uh, and are you collecting? Are you buying? Oh, yes. And so <laughs> It's an addiction. It is, it is really. <laughs> collecting art becomes an addiction. And, yeah. and you're addicted to what? Well, wanting to continue. Because you can go to the museum and look at it. Cindy Sherman. We started with Cindy Sherman at Mercer Street Metro Pictures in 1982, buying the photo stills for like, I think, $150, $200. Yeah. Every year we buy her work. She has a new series of work. We just bought two more pictures. We follow Jeff's. Uh, Jeff has okay. three or four things in fabrication. For okay, but it's part of it the idea that you want to be the best collector around because you have chosen your place and you want to make sure. I mean, it's a competitive spirit in you. I am competitive. <laughs>